amazed by that, by that whole, can you hear me? By that 30 second uh, thing, they asked me to do a 20 minute speech. I've never given less than an hour speech. At four in the morning this morning, I realized I'm still at like 35 minutes. I'm never gonna be able to do this. So it's amazing, you can do a 30 minute thing. So um, I'm really excited to talk about risk. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to do a little survey though before we start. Um, how many of you in the audience consider yourselves risk takers? I mean real risk takers, not like, raise your hand. <laughs> like not just like I wear, I don't wear a jacket when it's cold outside kind of thing, but real risk takers. Okay, a few of you, okay, maybe half. So for the people that don't consider themselves risk takers, I just wanna ask you a few questions. Um, how many of you have ever had unprotected sex? <laughs> okay, that's, that's pretty damn risky. Uh, how many of you have texted and drive, driven ever? Come on, everybody put their hand up there, yeah. That's really risky. <laughs> nice. How many of you have gotten drunk and then posted stupid shit on Facebook or Instagram? Huh, yeah, that's pretty risky. How many of you still eat at Qdoba? That's, yeah. You guys are nuts, you're all nuts. Anyway, um, it might surprise you, but I have never considered myself a risk taker. Um, and I know that seems ridiculous in the context of some of the stuff I've done. I've put STD stores in Omaha, um, scratch and sniff dirty diapers on bus shelters. I've put uh, uh, condom dresses in, in prom dress stores. You might have seen pregnant boys around town a few times. Um, and I know a lot of this stuff has created big national kind of controversies, you know, including putting babies with butcher knives. That started a whole national debate. But I've, I've never considered myself a risk taker. I've always just considered myself a problem solver. Um, and my mom, by the way, who's in town, she would beg to differ about that. Um, because she said I was a risk taker at a super early age. She said it started about four. Um, I had to do everything different than everybody else, including when Halloween came around. Um, I couldn't just get a normal costume from the store. I had to be a groundhog, all right? <laughs> you gotta be a real risk taker to say, I'm gonna be the only kid in the neighborhood dressed as a groundhog. You gotta make it. Um, from second grade to fourth grade, I was so obsessed with being a cowboy, I wore the same cowboy outfit for two years. Every day. <laughs> that was pretty risky. Um, then when I got older, we, had, we have a cabin up north in, in, um, in Wisconsin. There's a train tracks right by our house. I used to, when I was 12, 13, we used to jump on the train and ride it to the next town and jump off while it was moving. That was pretty stupid. Um, my mom and my mom had a big idea. There's a water ski show up there, and she got me in the water ski show. Every little town has a water ski show. And I w after a couple of years, you know, I was never content with just doing the normal kind of acts. Barefooting was really big in our water ski show. I had to do, I had to always do something crazier. So I had to, we had to do, couldn't just barefoot, we had to do barefoot pyramids. And then when I got bored with that, when I was 16, you know, we got to ratchet it up. Um, I, I read a, mag a national magazine that said people were barefoot jumping. And there was maybe 20 people in the whole country that did it. So I thought, I'm going to make a barefoot jump. And I started barefoot jumping. It's one of, the, one of the dumbest things you could ever do, by the way. Um, and then I got bored with that. I said, I'm going to ratchet up even farther. I'm going to do neck hold barefoots. So I did a lot of, my mom knew early on, she was really screwed with me, um, <laughs> that, that, that I was a risk taker. Um, and then um, I didn't really start, you know, as a, as a, as a guy in, in advertising, I, didn't, I wasn't really a risk taker in the beginning. It just kind of soaked up things. It wasn't until I got my job at, at BVK, where I am now, that, um, that, I, that I figured out the more risque the work that you did, the more recognition that you got for it. So I did all kinds of crazy stuff that made people uncomfortable, <laughs> that you know, kind of pushed the edge of taste. You know? and I, but I did it because taking those risks helped you win awards. And, and it was super self-serving, by the way. Um, I wanted to be well known, and so I took big risks to do it, um, including being threatened by a couple lawsuits. Here, here's, the, here's the biggest one. Donald Duck Orange Juice. It's that good. Donald Duck Orange Juice is now available at Schaefer's Food Mart. Over 1,000 brands under one nicely reshingled roof. It's funny when you imitate Donald Duck and use the word Donald Duck in an ad, Disney gets all crazy. <laughs> they get all, you get all kinds of letters. Um, uh, but all that risky advertising worked. 
you know, I wanted to get known, I wanted to be big in the advertising world. It brought me tons of fame, brought the agency tons of recognition, and it moved up my career. But eventually, I, 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 I think my purpose for taking risks started to change. Um, and so maybe six or seven years into my career, I realized that, you know, that, that, that as the agency grew, the challenges of businesses came to me, became bigger. And, and a lot of those, a lot of the companies we worked for didn't have very big budgets. They were really underdog kind of brands, up against big national brands. So um, I realized early on the only way to, to kind of over solve these really big problems was to take big risks. And, and um, and it, it, the challenges were all over the place, whether you're trying to save a struggling college or convince people to take life-saving cancer screenings or, or, or save tourism for a destination or stop a shaken baby epidemic. Um, and, and you had to do all this with a marketing campaign and with almost no money, uh, almost every time something came your way. So, you know, so, with that, that meant, so when someone comes into your office and says, you know, I need your help. We have the second biggest teen pregnancy problem in the city of Milwaukee. It's been that way for, for two decades, and no one knows about it, and no one cares about it. Um, and we need you to get everybody overnight to notice it and care about it. So you take chances. You, ha you take risks. You, know, you put pictures of teen pregnant boys over it. You, you make it impossible for people to ignore the problem. Um, you make people uncomfortable with their, their inaction. And overnight, it totally changed the way people looked at this problem. They recognized it was an important thing. Um, and I think... You know, but I was just solving a problem the best way I knew possible. I wasn't taking a risk. That's, that's all you were doing. And I think most risk takers look at what they do really as, um, uh, as problem solving. Um, um, I, I think they have, to, or they have to do it that way or, or they wouldn't do it at all. Because if I looked at everything as a risk you know, instead of just a problem solving thing, I probably would never do anything. You know, I mean, you, you, you'd be just focusing on what's scary about doing something different. What could go wrong? You know, the, the real paralyzing part of, of, of doing something different. The stuff that could backfire and wreck your reputation or, or maybe hurt a, a client or, or the cause that you're trying to help. Um, I, I also think that risk takers in general, they have a they have a great disdain for kind of following the rules of stuff. Um, my mom will tell you that I never follow the rules, obviously. Um, and, and, but when a, whenever a client tells me, you know, okay, here's a new job, you got to do it this certain way, oh, the first time, every time they say that, all the account people in the room just go, oh, don't tell Gary you can't do, not do something. He's going to do the polar opposite every time. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a fun example. Uh, I had a healthcare client in Missouri, and, and they came to us and said, here's the work plan, here's the brief. I want you to create a serious, emotional PSA aimed at men to get more of them to take colon cancer screenings. Okay? I, you know, you, I want you to make people cry. I want you to make them emotional about it, really inspire them. But it's got to be really serious, it's colon cancer. So this is what we did. It's not that big a deal. Getting a colonoscopy doesn't hurt at all, and it could save your life. So Learn basically, went, risk went, for colon cancer at sehealthcheck.com. So we went back to the client and said, just Southeast you know, Missouri Hospital, a healthier look at healthcare. So we went back to the client and said, just you know, we changed a couple of things. One, we're going to go after women because women are the ones that that make the appointments for men to get colon cancer screenings, not men. Um, uh, we're going to call out men for being wimps, for being crybabies, because that's the real only reason they don't go and get a cold. They all know why they should get one, but they don't do it because they're crybabies. Um, and we're going to do the funniest colon cancer campaign ever. This was so successful. Every year they do, a, during Colon Cancer Month, a campaign, and every year they have the same amount of colon screenings. 49% increase in two months after they launched this campaign. So um, taking, a, taking a little few calculated risks actually works. Um, Another trait that I think all risk takers share, including myself, is that we all have this inherent belief that, that nothing is impossible, nothing at all. Uh, and, I, and for me, I got that attitude, and I think you get it 
from how you're brought up uh, to some degree. I got it from my dad. Uh, my dad would give me chores all the time. Really, he was, a, he was a plumber, and he could make everything, build everything, so he'd give me these really hard things, and I'm, a horrible, I'm horrible with tools, and he'd say, you gotta go do this thing. And I'd sit there, and I'd try to figure it out, and I can't figure it out, it's impossible. I'd come back an hour later, I can't do it, Dad, I can't do this, this is impossible. And every time I'd do that, he'd look at me, and he'd say, you can't or you won't? And i look at him, and i go, I, I can't. I just told you, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how, I can't figure it out. And he'd go, you can't or you won't. And I'd be so pissed off. I'm, like, I'm 12 years old. I told you I can't do it, you know? He says, you can't or you won't. Go back and figure it out. And I'd go back, and almost every time, you'd spend, it may take five hours to figure out some 10-minute thing, but I figured it out. And, and, and um, I, I realized you know, I didn't, I didn't know what he meant for the longest time, and I realized over time what he really meant is, you know, I won't keep trying, uh, uh, because real problem solvers, real risk takers, people who believe anything's possible, they keep working the problem till they solve it, period. There's no excuses, ever, um, which is a really handy trait to have when, you know, someone comes into your office again with another problem and says, you know, um, there's a rash of shaken, ba uh, shaken babies in, in, in Milwaukee, um, and I need your help. Um, this was a real, this really happened. A woman came in and said, I, I, I don't, we don't have any money. Um, we got to stop this problem. There's babies being shaken every day. Babies dying. Um, and I need you to come up with an ad that's so powerful, if you only heard it one time in your whole life, you'd never forget it. And I have no money. And I need to do it as fast as possible because babies are dying. And you look at her and go, well, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? I, you know. And uh, you know, I'll think about it, and you kind of part ways. And, and I, there was nothing you could do for this person, and I, th that's an impossible thing. And then it just, you can't or you won't. You can't or you won't. That's always in my head, all the time. Um, and after a couple of weeks, I came up with an idea. Create a spot that if you heard it only once, you'd never forget it. And this was the spot. Shaken Baby Association and the Milwaukee Area Radio Stations. That spot played at 7.20 in the morning um, at during drive time. What do you think you'd do if you heard that spot in the first 10 seconds? You would change the channel, exactly. And what do you think you heard when you changed the channel? That spot was on every station at exactly the same time. Um, <laughs> it was a PR stunt. It aired one time. Everybody in the city heard it. If they didn't hear it actually live, they heard it on the news because uh, there were six and a half hours of TV and radio coverage about the campaign and the issue for the month afterwards. The most amazing thing was, and, and not a penny was spent, um, the amazing thing was that after 27 shakings in a seven month period, including three shakings the week that we did this, just by accident, all the shakings in the city of Milwaukee stopped for four months afterwards. And then they went down by double digits for the next two years. Um, so the biggest risk, people always ask, what's the biggest risk you've ever taken in an advertising campaign? The, the biggest one is the one I did for the beaches of Fort Myers, Sanibel, um, after the Gulf oil spill. You remember the Gulf oil spill? Yeah. Well, the Gulf oil spill was, you know, first, it, most people think of it as an environmental disaster. Well, for the beaches of Fort Myers, it was a tourism disaster. Because a month into it, I don't know if you remember, they reported oil being washed up on a beach in Florida, one beach. And every night in the news, they say, there's oil on the beaches in Florida. This is right at the start of the second biggest tourism season that they have, the summer tourism season. And so nobody was calling. 
any of the tourism, that any, any of the beach destinations. No one was calling, no one's booking vacations, people were canceling their vacations. There was going to be no tourism. BP gave millions and millions of dollars to all the biggest destinations. The average was probably a million and a half, two million dollars over a month. People were, were running ads across the country that said they show, showed old pictures of their beaches with, with uh, headlines that say, our beaches are all free, we're open. And every night on the news, they'd show that one beach in Florida with oil on it. And nobody paid attention to the millions and millions of dollars of ads. We were the last, our destination, little destination, the last people to get money. You know how much money we got? $250,000. Our client came, this is like June 9th, came to us and said, we got an emergency. We got $250,000 to do a national campaign, and we're going to be the only ones that convince the whole world there's no oil on our beaches. We need you to do that. You have two days to come up with an idea, and we need to be on air with whatever we're doing in nine days after that. So, came up with an idea. It had to be a PR stunt. The news had to tell our story. We couldn't do something big enough. Um, and we had to compete with the fact that this news is fresh every day. So I thought, we can't do what everybody's doing. We've got to take a risk. We've got to make a spot every single day in a different part of the destination and air it that same day. Okay? So we'll create it in the morning. We'll get up crazy early. We'll create it, edit it, get it uploaded to a station. We'll buy one spot a night on the ABC Nightly News. Okay? We'll get a crazy character, unemployed actor named Dan, Okay, a ragtag, goofy crew of people, of young guys. Basically, they're single guys that didn't have to work for nine days. Okay, they didn't have kids. We paid them a hundred dollars a day. That's how crazy this was. And we went out to Florida. We made a commercial every single day. We made it in the morning. We edited it at different hotel rooms in an hour and a half. It had to be uploaded by twelve o'clock. Had to be approved by ten thirty by the client. Then we had to do a bunch of work, upload it by twelve, or or it didn't work to air one time a night. This is the first spot we did. My name is Dan. It's Monday, June 21st, and I'm here on the beaches of Fort Myers, Sanibel, to see for myself if there's been any damage from the oil spill. And I'm no beach doctor. I mean, I didn't go to a fancy beach doctor school, but it's pretty easy for a layman to tell if there's been any damage. No, it's salty. It's salty. No oil, but it's salty. So I'll be here for the next nine days to check out the beaches for you to make sure everything's okay. I don't know why you wouldn't be here. Check out great deals and vacation guarantees at fortmyerssanibel.com. So we got that air. We, we uploaded that spot at 11.57 the first time. We didn't even know if we could do it. We didn't know if it was possible. Just a crazy idea that looked good on paper. The real thing was, though, after the first spot aired, we were going to send PR to all the news stations in America about the little destination that was telling the world in a crazy different way that nobody ever had that their beaches were all free. That was the only way this was going to work. And it did. 400 news stations in the next 48 hours told the story that there's this beach in Florida that's doing this crazy thing to get everybody's attention. We got millions and millions of dollars of media attention. And then we created spots for the next nine days. And, and, here's, the, and here's the crazy thing. The crazy thing is that, is that we, we made a spot every day. We had a concept the next spot the night before. We had no talent for these spots. I was at the hotel pool bar, and we'd find people that were staying there and ask them to be in spots the next day. That's how, how rough this was, all right? We even got Willard Scott. On day three, he said, I wonder if Willard Scott would come down. He's from here. And do two days later, he came down and filmed the commercial. So it was the riskiest thing we ever did, ever, ever did. But by the end of August, by the end of August, they, it went for no tourism. There was no tourism season. Places were going out of business and laying off all their workers. Two, they were only down 3% by the end of, their, by the, uh, end of the, the end of the full year. They were up 2%. Every other destination was down double digits that year. We were the only one. We saved tourism. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I think the bigger thing is that, you know, we recognized everybody else played it safe. We didn't. Um, they were invisible. We took a giant risk, and it paid off. One of the biggest things about when you take big risks, though, if you want things to actually work, you have to be incredibly stubborn about them. You have to refuse basically to accept no as an answer. And, and I've done that many times. That shaking baby spot, all the stations but five turned me down when I said we want to put it all at the same time. Not, not many people know that. I emailed them two days later, and I said, just so you guys all know, we got tremendous response. 17 of the 21 stations said yes, and if you last four want to jump in at the last second, great, we'll put you on the news release. It's going to be an historic event. Within 30 minutes, all the stations said, oh, I want to be on that. I don't want to miss this big thing. 
A lot of people don't know about the campaign we just did. When we actually, uh, we got the thing uploaded and we were all high-fiving each other. It's the greatest thing ever. All of a sudden, an hour afterwards, we get a, we get a um, call from ABC. And they said, we can't air your spot. In fact, we, we don't want to air the rest of this campaign. Doing it this way is too crazy. Like, what do you mean? Um, the person's drinking water. It's not potable water. We can't air a spot showing someone drink water. If you can prove ocean water is drinkable, then, uh, then we'll go for it. We can't. And we went back and forth with lawyers for two hours. The client comes in and said, we're dead. We're done. The whole thing's over. Started packing up. Started. The whole thing failed. This whole thing you pitched this doesn't work. So they're walking out the door, and I said, I had an idea. I go, can you give me five minutes? I want to send one email. Five minutes. Sat down, I banged out an email, I sent it to, the, to their lawyer they had. Here's what it read. I'm saddened by the news your network chose to refuse to air the one ad that might actually save the tourism season in Fort Myers Sanibel, a region that's already been devastated by one natural disaster has forced, that has forced the layoff of tens of thousands of workers. And now they'll be, they'll be devastated again by the second disaster caused by ABC's refusal to air the one campaign that could actually save this fragile region and help parents provide for their families. I don't know how your decision to further devastate the economy of Fort Myers Sanibel will be re re viewed by the rest of the national media, but I wish you well. <laughs> Ten minutes later, they approved the spot. <laughs> and the whole campaign worked. Send one email. That's all it was. Um, people ask me what risks, what risks have I ever done that backfired. I've had a few that backfired. Uh, the craziest one that nobody knows about that blown up, this is the most interesting one, is um, I was asked to do a campaign, the first campaign about statutory rape problem in Milwaukee, and I had the greatest campaign ever done for statutory rape. I focus group tested it with men because I wanted to stigmatize it, make men feel real pervy about the fact that they wanted to pr prey on young girls. So I focus group this thing. I saw first thing I got to turn their heads to a message they don't want to get, right? It's an incredible idea. Put little girls' heads on very well-endowed bodies, because every guy in the world is going to look at that. I focus group tested this. People said, oh my gosh, that's, I'll look at that. I get the message. Every guy I tested it with. When you look at young girls or something more, you need help. We get this thing. United Way loves it. Three days before it launches, somebody at our, our, in our PR department is a little overzealous about it and sends it to a bunch of ad blogs, and it starts popping up in ad blogs. And I start getting calls from people. Have you seen your ad campaign? It's online right now. And I said, no, what are you talking about? There's some really mad comments. Hundreds hour later, there's now thousands of comments online about this campaign. Women are really pissed off about this campaign. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is an incredible campaign. This is two days maybe before it launches. Then I'm watching TV that night. This comes on TV. So the thing I missed in this and I learned is that you can't just stay so laser focused on your one audience. There's unintended consequences. I didn't consider that other people might see this and think it's the worst thing ever done. So, so now I apply a different filter to stuff. I'm almost done. I know I'm out of time. Um, uh, you know, the thing about taking risks, you know, you talk about what's the value of taking risks. All the risks you take and every, having kids and getting married is one of the biggest risks you could take. But if you, did, if you didn't take it, you know, this is my family, I wouldn't have such an unbelievable family, you know. If I hadn't taken a risk with that uh, and, could, and basically lied to all those radio stations there at that spot, twice we actually did this and twice all the shakings in Milwaukee, maybe they wouldn't have stopped. Maybe it would have kept going up. Maybe more babies would have died. Um, if I wouldn't have worked on done the, some of the riskiest campaigns for teen pregnancy over the last eight years, Maybe teen pregnancy wouldn't have, maybe it wouldn't have gone down 56%. Maybe it would have gone down 25%. Think of all the kids that uh, um, you know, wouldn't have the same kind of teen life. 
And if I wouldn't take the biggest risk of all, and the biggest risk of all was me marrying my wife, finding my best friend in the whole world. She's right there, Deb. She puts up with a lot of crap from me. Yeah, give her a big round of applause. She has to live with all this shit. Um, if I wouldn't have taken the biggest risk of life, I wouldn't, ha I w I wouldn't have my best friend uh, uh, for my whole life and wouldn't be married for the last 17 years. So the bottom line is, and this is, I know this is cliche, but it's really not if you live this. Um, you know, the, the biggest risk in life is, is really not taking risks. So um, that's all I got for now. Anybody have any questions?